Now, as no doubt noticed that the novel coronavirus has a new official name, COVID-19, short for Coronavirus Disease 19. The World Health Organization says the new name helps prevent inaccuracies and will stop any particular place, animal or group of people being stigmatized. There have already been reports of xenophobic behavior towards Asians since the outbreak began. The hashtag, I am not a virus, began trending in France after those of Cambodian and Vietnamese descent reported a rise in negative attitudes. The WHO hopes that will change with a more neutral name. In 2009, it stopped using the term swine flu and replaced it with H1N1 after the pork market took a huge hit. But there's been a long history of diseases being named after places and animals. In 1918, the influenza pandemic was referred to the Spanish flu, even though it did not originate in Spain. In 2012, there was the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, or MERS, that first appeared in Saudi Arabia. And in 2014, Ebola, which was named after a river in the Democratic Republic of Congo near the location of the original outbreak. Experts agree that as diseases spread regionally and even globally, some labels can be confusing. Now, for more on COVID-19, we're joined by Professor Annalise Wilder-Smith, a visiting professor at the Lee Kuan Chien School of Medicine in Singapore. Thank you very much, Professor Wilder-Smith, for joining us. Um, so we're getting reports um, and data showing that the outbreak may have peaked or is about to. Do you agree? Help us understand this. It is indeed encouraging to see the numbers of new infections declining in China. However, we need to remember that such numbers can fluctuate from day to day and new seed seedings can still occur and therefore we should not feel reassured at this stage until we have seen a consistent decline of cases over several, several weeks. Unfortunately, as you know, there are now already 125 cases outside of China in 17 countries and those exported cases can trigger new chains of transmission. Professor, the World Health Organization has already branded this virus public enemy number one. Those are very strong words, uh, reflecting perhaps the seriousness of this situation. The, the situation is serious. It is a um, respiratory pathogen that seems to be highly transmissible. Uh, we do not fully yet understand the um, case fatality rate. It does look much lower than for SARS. But until we have better data, uh, we cannot uh, pin down the exact case fatality rate. Well, we know that scientists from around the world are meeting in Geneva to discuss ways to combat the outbreak. But what's the overriding concern for the community here, though? The overriding concern is that this um, will cause widespread community spread and, um, and, and further geographic spread to other areas. The, the, the real concern, obviously, is that we cannot contain uh, this, this virus and that it may cause a pandemic. Professor, I'd like you to share with us now you know, the issue of this, of a vaccine, a potential vaccine. Uh, they're talking about an 18-month timeline for one. Uh, there are other experts who are skeptical about that, but what can be done until then? Let's say one does appear in 18 months. What can we do with our ava available arsenal of weapons against this virus? So the first imperative is now to try everything to contain this virus. We may fail in containing it, and then the next step is to move into a mitigation mode. That means trying to reduce the peak of, of uh, new cases and trying to reduce deaths. So until we have a vaccine available, we need to rely and employ what we call 14th century containment measures. And these are detect, isolate, and quarantine. These are the tools that we have at hand in the moment. And the emphasis here is again on early detection, prompt isolation, and then prompt contact tracing and quarantining of all contacts. This is how we successfully contain SARS, but this COVID-19 um, may uh, behave differently. It definitely looks 
more transmissible, and therefore we really need now to think what do we need to do to mitigate it further. Professor, you mentioned there about the um, geographic spread, uh, unable to contain this virus. There is concerns now about the ability of developing countries to contain and control the outbreak. Question is, what can the international community do to help them? So, so currently there are all efforts uh, and it's really a coordinated effort by WHO to bring together all the experts and just today and yesterday we had, there was a big meeting here at WHO in Geneva um, from, from, you know, now developing rapid uh, therapeutic interventions, so to, uh, for better clinical management and to reduce deaths, to, uh, to many other uh, countermeasures that we need to think of, including how to deal with the pandemic of social media panic. Um, and then, of course, there, we, we can anticipate some of the geographic spread because of air passenger uh, numbers. Uh, and, and so, and indeed, our, our predictions came true. And Singapore and Thailand and various other countries that we predicted were the first to be affected. But our main concern is that this may also spread to countries that are less prepared compared to Singapore to deal with this novel virus. So our main concern is, for example, the continent of Africa, where they may not have the, the, uh, the ability to, um, to scale up a rapid response. And there's even a problem with access to diagnostic essays in the moment. So, so the world is now needs to um, really come and behind Africa and help them set up um, all, all the measures to be able to, to cope with this, should, should, it, should it be imported. Thank you so much, Professor, for um, speaking to us. Professor Analyst Wilder Smith, visiting professor at the Lee Conscience School of Medicine in Singapore.